This show talks about books that feature mental health and mental illness topics. There are many books that include this topic, and my hope is that more and more people know about them because they help to decrease the stigma and help people not feel so alone in their struggle. I am your host, Robin Tamanaha, licensed marriage and family therapist. Joining me on this episode is my guest, Carol Lozier, who wrote the book DBT Therapeutic Activity Ideas for Kids and Caregivers. Hi, Carol. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Doing well. Good. Well, thank you for being my guest. First, I'd like my guests to introduce themselves. So is there anything you'd like to say about yourself, such as who you are, what you do, or anything you'd like the listeners to know? Sure. Um, so I'm a therapist in Louisville, Kentucky, and I actually have a degree in social work. So I'm an LCSW here. And I've been practicing for over 30 years, which makes me sound so old. And <laughs> I've been in private practice for over 20. And I primarily work with adopted and foster kiddos, um, people who've had trauma. And then I'm also intensively trained in DBT, which I know will lead us into what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's awesome. Out of curiosity, mm -hmm. what was it that drew you to like adoption and like DBT? Well, way back when, when I was young, <laughs> um, my very first job out of school was uh, absolutely amazing. So I got to work. I graduated from Florida State, um, and I, my very first job was working in a therapeutic preschool program. So all the children that we got into the program were either they were all CPS kiddos under the mm -hmm. umbrella of CPS. So mm -hmm. most of them were in kinship adoption. Some were still with birth family. Um, but that's really was my first introduction into the world of adoptions. And I know it's so cute because so many people who I work with assume that I have adopted kids, which I don't, or they assume I'm adopted, which I'm not. Um, but I've always loved working with kids. I just feel like there's such bright little shining stars and they're so much fun. And um, so again, so that's how I sort of got into it. And I've just always had my toe in there and probably, I don't know, 15 years into my practice, I really you know, like all of us, right? It takes time to really kind of get into the groove of being a therapist yeah. and really understand like people, I know people hear us say that it's an art form, but you have to really be there to totally get it is an art form. And so about 15 years in, I really wanted to specialize in something. And I'd always you know, kind of had worked, I'd always worked with kids, but I'd always along the way kept working with adopted kids. And that was just such a love. I just really wanted to do it. And so in working with adopted kids, I also knew that I had to have a modality that allowed me to work with trauma. Yeah. And so I, um, I learned EMDR. I took it way back when it was more simple. It's so complicated now. Um, it's, but I just love EMDR. I think it was a game changer for my practice. And so once I really started working with kids, I would see that their trauma would be resolved. But because so much of their energy and, and life was put into getting through that trauma, it was almost like they missed all those developmental steps of learning coping skills. Yeah. Yeah. And so once the kids I was working with in teens, once their trauma lessened, they still had all these missing gaps of like how to cope with life and emotions. And so actually one of the moms I was working with, her daughter came to me and said, hey, do you know about this DBT therapy? And I was like, well, I've heard of it, but I don't know too much. And so I started looking into it and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what I've been looking for. So I just kind of dove in and took my first class. And um, then I did an intensive training online with behavior tech. That's Dr. Linehan's group yeah. that does all the training. And it was like 15 months long, almost like a second master's program. I mean, it was crazy intensive. I heard it's really when, intensive. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. When they say intensive, they mean it. And um, so I'm still getting monthly consultation with my DBT team. So part of being in an inherent program is staying on a team. Mm -hmm. So I can't say I'm fully adherent to DBT because 
I think in private practice, that's really hard to do. I know certainly people can do it. Um, with the pandemic right now, my groups are on pause because it's, you know, with social distancing is almost impossible. So, yeah. 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 Thank you for, for sharing that. That's so interesting. And it's yeah, so interesting thanks. how like sometimes things start as, you know, one thing and then it kind of evolves. And then like we have this journey that like kind of leads into like maybe what our niche is or what like is our heart and our passion. And it sounds like sure. for you, that was also uh, that was also yours. So that's amazing. And foster and adoptive. That's so um, wonderful. And they're so, and you know, working with those kids, it's like, it's so neat because you really see such transformation and growth. It's just so wonderful. Yeah. 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 Well, I read your book and I love it. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I will say I've, attempted to read other dbt books um in the past and it was super informative but it was like a lot lot of information this was like years ago too when i was initially starting and i just remember thinking like how how do i take this and like put it in the therapy room because i'm the therapist and i i just it was like kind of hard for it to like mesh it together um but i felt like with your book it made me understand it better and even like in um like a more digestible way and also like in a way that's applicable because there's like the theory parts and all the different components and that and then there's the application and like melding those two together can be kind of tricky sometimes with certain interventions but with your book I felt like it was done in a way that I felt like yeah like even I would feel confident I think using it yeah great Thank you. That means so much to me. So I totally agree. Like when I started learning DBT, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so, and nothing against it. Like, you know, the, the folks that work hard on DBT are amazing people. You know, their, their foundation is behavior and cognitions and, and they're so smart group of people. But, you know, when I was looking at transforming this into my practice, First of all, there really wasn't anything for kids. And secondly, everything out there, pretty much, not everything, a lot of it, I'm trying to be dialectical, a good part of it was very academic and boring. And I'm thinking it's hard enough getting kids' attention. Like you put that in front of them and it's almost like, you know, the Charlie Brown's wah, wah, wah. Like, you know, they're not going to listen. And I'm usually like doing jumping jacks and trying to get kids to pay attention. And I'm thinking that's just going to work against me. So I started by, so by the time I started doing DBT, I had already written three books. Um, the previous books were on adoptions and foster care kinds of topics. So as I started teaching DBT to the kids, I started making my own worksheets and handouts because I wanted them to be fun and engaging and to use vocabulary and language and examples that would really make sense to the kids. And so that's kind of how this book was, let's just say that's how this book was born. I mean, yeah. it was, it was, you know, it came about from my work, just practical application. And so I'm a really visual person. I learn better by seeing. And so that's why probably this also spoke to me was because it's handouts, worksheets, things you draw. Yeah, so wonderful. And so for your for your book, would a therapist have to be trained in DBT to use it or not so much? Not at all. Like, again, traditional DBT people would would always say, yes, you need you need training. And I, I can't, you know, I don't fully disagree with that. And yet there definitely are portions I disagree. So, you know, there's something called adherent DBT, where you have to go by the full model mm -hmm. to be in alignment with the correct use of it. So that's, you know, skills group, individual therapy, if it's kids and teens, you know, including parents and family work, um, phone coaching, which is after hours, emergency kinds of stuff, being on a DBT consultation team. I hope I didn't forget anything. Um, so it's all of that. Right. And let's face it, like if you work in a hospital or an agency or something where there's a group of people set up to work together. Yeah, you can just be part of that team and it makes it so easy. But 
as a private practitioner or solo practitioner, that's really hard to do. And so instead of being certified or having lots of training, you can be what's called DBT informed, where let's say a kiddo comes in and, you know, they're just being very impulsive. Well, you can just pull out one skill like the SOP skill and use that handout to explain it to the child and then use the worksheet as homework or as Mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I always say, especially for kids like 6 to 12, which is what this book is aimed toward, parents need to be in the room. Like, if you're teaching a skill, the parent has to be there. Because if you're, you know, meeting with the parents at the beginning and then at the very end and you're explaining it to the child who's not going to fully get everything, and then you're sending that little child home with handing this paper to the parent, I mean, how are they going to work on it? Right. So... You know, the parent needs to be in the room. Of course, that's just the way I do things. But I always have the parent in the room where I'm working on these kinds of things. So that way they're both hearing it at the same time. The parent can ask questions. I can clarify. We can practice together. And then they're ready to try it at home. Yeah, I could imagine, too, how that would also, like, help the parents feel really confident, too, in, like, using some of these. Because, yeah, like... You can read something or hear explanations, but then even even if it's watching or kind of getting practice with the application piece can be huge. And also, I can't even imagine, too, like what that would do for the bond and attachment as well. Yeah. 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 So could we dive into um, maybe some of the four modules of DBT, if you're comfortable, Um, either for, you know, for listeners who don't know, um, or maybe some that do, and it's kind of like a, just like a general review. Would you feel comfortable with that? Sure. I'd love to. Yeah. So what are those? Okay. So there's four modules, which is also the same thing as saying groups of skills in DBT. Um, and so this is more for the kiddos that I'm talking about. Again, that's ages six to 12. So that's called DBT C. So there's mindfulness, distress, tolerance, emotion regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. So would you like me to explain those? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so mindfulness in DBT is similar to what kind of just the the popular right now, you know, idea of mindfulness, except in DBT, there's no religion. There's no religious component to it. So it's about being in the moment, Um, being non-judgmental, really paying attention fully inside yourself and outside yourself with your five senses. So it's really helping people be grounded in that moment. Um, The distress tolerance groups of skills are helping kids get through tough situations, usually emotionally tough situations without making things worse, right? So without being demanding or having temper tantrums or, screaming, you know, if you don't do it, I'm, you know, I'm going to run away or I hate you so much or right. We want to try to help them avoid those behaviors that just make everything so much worse. Mm -hmm. Emotion regulation skills are really helping kids understand and identify their emotions. So we want kids to be able to name their emotions. And what we know is if they're able to do that, then they're able to change their emotion. Right. If you don't recognize your emotion, you can't change it. Right. So first and foremost, we need them to understand and identify it. And then lastly is the interpersonal effectiveness skills, which that group of skills is helping kids learn to get along better with other people. And in addition, so in in this book for the kiddos, I also have which is not one of the four modules, but I also have in the back the sixth session section. It's hard to say that fast (laughs) of the book is skills for parents to use in parenting their child. So it's um, acceptance and change strategies like validation, being mindful in the relationship with their child, helping the parent be wise minded and then more like the change strategy. So shaping behavior, using behavior charts, and then explaining to parents how to increase or decrease their child's behavior. Wow. You know, as you, even as you were explaining like the, the first four, like for the child, like 
as you were explaining that, what ran through my mind is like, almost like going back to childhood, like all these different like situations where stuff like that would be so helpful in the world, whether it's like in the home, in the school, outside, especially social in our interactions, you know, too, like I could see how that's so helpful. It is. I totally agree. As a matter of fact, I learned when I was learning the skills, even as an adult, and I feel like I'm an emotionally balanced person, I still was like, oh my gosh, these are awesome. I, I use the skills. Like hopefully every DBT practitioner does. But yeah, I, I think that too, Robin, like, wow, if I could have known these as a child, I think, especially navigating those middle school years. Oh my goodness. Uh. My curly hair, my blue, Catwoman glasses. It really would have come in handy to have some <laughs> some skills. Yeah, and also the, with for the parents too, because then like, understandably, you know, if the child you know is having certain you know emotions that are intense or, um, you know, they're reacting or responding a certain way, like it's quite natural for them the parent to all have their own. <laughs> response and reaction so then it's like how do you what do you do with that you know so that you can also um you know assist the child right exactly yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. so right yeah as the parents are learning with their child they're learning for themselves too because these are the exact same skills that we teach adults it's just a little bit transformed in terms of language and illustrations and making it fun and engaging for kids, but it's, it's the same information. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. And I did like too how, um, the activities too were super creative because like you said before, um, working with kids and I, that's what I always loved about working with kids is I felt like I could be creative and there were so many other ways to do things or like moving your body or being engaging or using, you know, props or, you know, whichever. Um, so I was, I thought it was wonderful too, that in your book, there are, you know, with the handouts and even the directives too, which I, I didn't mention that earlier. Um, but I just remember now too, and just like the exact clear, like how you introduce the intervention or the skill and then Mm -hmm. doing that with the client and the caregivers is great. So then you also have the actual, even for the therapist, like application to and applying that for the, for the child or the caregiver. Right. Well, you know, it's funny, as I was writing the book, um, worksheet section, there's always suggestions for the therapist because why should, why should the person reading this book, why should they go through the same challenges I did? Like learn from me, like you've got an older sister here, right? Like my suggestions are usually mistakes that I've made or things that I've learned along the way that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You're just learning from what I've done. Right. And then, you know, in the handout section, I've got those discussion questions. So questions I usually ask when I'm discussing that skill. Yeah, definitely. Do you have um, any tips or thoughts for newer therapists that are maybe working with like school age kids and their caregivers? Yeah. So actually in the front of the book, um, I do have seven different suggestions because, like I said, I've been doing this 30 years and I've been working with kids for 30 years. So in the very front of the book, I've got seven different ideas for newer therapists in working with kiddos. So the first one is to be yourself. I think that You know, especially kids, if you walk in the room, because I know in the very beginning, I was like, oh, I have to be a therapist as opposed to just being in the room and being myself still within those professional boundaries. So it's so important to be authentic, like kids, kids know in a heartbeat if you're being anything but and they will not open up to you. They will not Mm -hmm. want to really work with you because they think you're fakey and they, they, you know, even if they don't cognitively know it. They know it in their being that you're not being honest with them. So I think that would be the first thing is to beat yourself. Yeah. And it's so interesting, too, because I, you know, when I spoke with other therapists and even some that like I came out of my program with, like, it was interesting coming out of grad school in like two ways. One, or even as I was in my um, my placement, having to or feeling like you needed to be a certain way as a therapist. 
which I always found confusing when working at a youth site, because with kids, it's it's different. It's a different approach. And then also that grad, or at least my graduate program didn't really give me too much as how to even work with kids in general. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I um I was you know, I went to Florida State and I was blessed. There was a gentleman in town in Tallahassee who worked at the university. And so that class was all about play therapy. And it was an amazing class. I learned so much. Okay. And then, of course, my internships were with kids. Mm -hmm. So so I kind of started learning right away. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, was there anything I didn't ask that you wanted to bring up? For sure. sure. So um, I do have another exciting venture that I'm on right now, and that is uh, my sister is also a licensed social worker. She's in California near you, San Diego. And we together are doing online courses to mm -hmm. help therapists um, really move past those insecurities to write their own book without having to jump through the hoops of traditional publishing. Oh. Because, yeah. yeah, so we've got, um, so it's therapist as writers and we have a Facebook group. We have a website. Um, we're still kind of in those beginning stages of learning how to get the courses up and running. But this year for sure, um, we're going to have two courses or more on teaching other therapists to write their own book, which is so exciting because when you think about it, um, you know, it's like every time I write a book, I picture all the kids that will be helped by every therapist that reads the book. And it's just like a ripple effect in terms of how many people you can really serve. Yeah. And so, you know, I want to encourage other therapists to write their book because most of us want to have a book because this book's been singing in the back of your mind for years. It's just getting it out on paper. Yeah. That makes me excited because I'm definitely obviously a book uh, lover. <laughs> right, you know? right. So I'm always like, yes, yeah, so I want to absorb like all the books, um, especially by therapists, because I think, you know, like your experience was one, you know, I'm sure a lot of other therapists, like there's definitely like a journey to be told and so much like helpful information um, that's out there, even if it's like, you know, maybe there's this other, you know, this. Uh, easier way to do something or something that's uh, in a way that's like more understandable. Right. Or just exactly. like the as opposed to very much like the textbooky, which can help, you know, but sure. the application yeah. piece like is huge. Um, can't even imagine like mm -hmm. the type of books. Memoir. Oh, there's so many. Yeah, wow. for sure. There's so yeah. many because like you said, I mean, there are great textbooks out there, and there's also, you know, how to actually put that into practice in the therapy room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or even like self-help too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so many. Yeah. I mean, it's endless numbers of ways. And there's also journals, workbooks. I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. things, you know, that people can can do and be creative and put their work out there in such a way that not only are they helping people, but they're also earning a second income stream. Yeah. You know, and, which. Yeah. Yeah. And some of us in private practice we kind of do like multiple things. Too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 I, it's just interesting because there's this myth that that I think people think you have to have a publisher to make money with a book. And actually, I think the, tr the opposite is true because um, I had one book with a traditional publisher, my fourth. And what people don't realize is you only get 10 percent of the royalty. Whereas if you self-publish, you get like 55%. Oh. So, yeah. yeah, huge difference. Well, that will be helpful, uh, what you're doing, because I know nothing about, like, the publishing world. It's um, in general, like, even, like, how that works, getting started, what that road even, like, looks like. Um, and... Who knows if that may make someone like hesitant, you know, not mm -hmm. unknown and like what that even that breakdown looks like to hold them back, you know, from writing a book. So that's great that you're doing that. And two, like I've been very surprised, even within my practice, how many clients ask for books mm -hmm. and actually do really love reading them and want oh, more yeah. 
even in between mm-hmm. sessions or just on their own on certain topics. Um, that was one of the first things that I think surprised me in private practice. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, a lot of clients also also love them. You know, some people think yeah. they're going to want to read this, but a lot of people. So many people. Yep. Yeah. So many people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as far as for your books, since you have multiple, where can your books be purchased? Um, all of my books are on Amazon and they're also internationally sold at various um, kind of other online booksellers like in Australia, New Zealand, Europe. I, so I don't know the names of those okay. booksellers. I just know that they're um, distributed through what's a publisher called Ingram Spark. But here in America, you can get it on Amazon Great. and Canada, I'm sure. Nice. And um, if the listeners are interested in finding more about you, is there a website you could share for that? Sure. Yeah, I have two. So I have my um, individual therapy practice and books, and that's on www.carollosierlcsw.com. And then for the book writing website, that's therapistaswriters.com. Great. So either one. Great. Okay. And for our listeners, Carol was generous and provided uh, two free handouts. There's the stop skills and um, self soothe. So I will have those available for download on the podcast website, booksbetweensessions.com. Um, and I know they're also, I believe also available on Carol's website as well, but I'll definitely have it on ours just so um, it'll be a simple button. You can click and just download this handout. So thank you for yeah, providing that. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for, for being here with me. Um, it was great to have you on. I can definitely see how your book is helpful for a therapist, the kids, the caregivers. And like I said, I really love it. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Hopefully this was informative or helpful. If you think this episode may be helpful to others that you know, please be sure to share this episode with them. Resources mentioned on this episode can be found at the podcast website, booksbetweensessions.com. The social media handles and website for today's guest is listed in the show notes and on booksbetweensessions.com. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please be sure to leave us a rating. If you would like to stay up to date, please subscribe to this podcast and follow the podcast Instagram, Books Between Sessions. I post multiple videos and lives every month. So be sure to follow our Instagram so you can see extra content. And if you have any book suggestions or books you would like discussed on this podcast, please send us a message on the contact page of the podcast website, booksbetweensessions.com. If you're an author who has written a book that includes mental health or mental illness topics and would like to be a guest on the podcast, complete the form on the Be on the Podcast page of our website. Also, this podcast is not psychotherapy or counseling. If you need to speak with a professional, you should find one local to you and contact them directly. If this is an emergency, please call your local emergency number or go to your nearest emergency department.